um, get a, um, start uh, doing that. Let me let me make two three quick points. Um, firstly, um, you know when we started uh, discussing about this workshop with uh, with with Seva Bharat, with Renana and and, and others, um, you know it took us few, a couple of years before we uh, get to this point. So um, it takes time to uh, do things here. So the first uh, point I want to make. Uh, secondly. Um, but probably it's not all that bad because when we were um, discussing, we were talk talking of a much smaller scale technical workshop, probably focusing on a state. And in these two years, there is a lot of momentum behind this idea as we could see in the last two days. And, and so, you know, we are speaking at a much higher level and, 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 and with direct uh, sort of connections to policy. Um, so um, the second, second is where we are coming from. We means uh, International Development Research Center. Uh, we have a program on, uh, um, program on supporting research on inclusive economies. And th that looks broadly at labor, labor policy, minimum and living wage, labor standards in factory floors and value chains, uh, women in labor force, uh, women-owned enterprises, youth em employment, and a whole lot of interventions on, on, uh, on uh, focusing on financial inclusion. Um, targeting women and youth. So that's that's the program which is supporting this workshop. So that, that's where our interests are. And so when we saw these uh, pilots in Madhya Pradesh and in, and in Delhi, we thought you know this is a really important issue, an instrument of finan financial inclusions that we should um, that we should um, support more discussion and, and better understanding. Uh, uh, you know in our in our in our poverty re poverty reduction work. Thirdly, um, in terms of the discussion in the last last two days, uh, I, I want to uh, pick up three three of three of the important, very important issues for the next steps. First is, you know, in terms of um, defining the universe, universal basic income. So, what what is that universe uh, for for India, or for the first phase of uh, uh, you know bigger sort of uh, experimentation trials. Uh, and related to this issue of, um, uh, you know, targeting uh, and, and wrongful or rightful inclusion and exclusion related to that issue, that's the first big block that has to be operationalized. Um, the second big po big block is, of course, the politics of it. The whole, you know, the state's preparedness, who is ready, who are the champions, where you can get uh, get get to uh, at the next level. And and third is. Um, this issue which Shekhar has articulated most eloquently in the previous session is the issue of regressive subsidy system, phasing out some of the universal subsidy system and moving on to the, to the basic income sort of um, transition. And, and, and there, I think, um, um, you know, my take on this is that we should exclude some of those subsidies in this discussion on basic income for a variety of reasons, and, and, and that being you know, the, the programs on health and education. They are completely different category of, of things compared to, say, um, subsidies for fertilizers or, or kerosene. Let us take health in point, just to clarify that point. You know, health is not just uh, people seeking health care for health problems. Health is a much bigger conundrum that includes preventive, uh, promotive, and other aspects. And, and therefore, if you look at you know, two top success stories of health in India, you would have to talk about um, polio eradication. You'll have to talk of decline in uh, HIV incidence, new infections in India, which are both in the preventive domains. And, and therefore, so you know, putting, uh, reducing health to just you know, health care um, is, is, is probably a very myopic way of looking at it. And, and, and let us not forget that there are only uh, 27,000, 28,000 doctors at the primary health care level for 830 million people still. So it's, it's, it's a very different discussion from fertilizer subsidies. Similarly, education sector will also have similar sorts of discussion. So, um, so with these observations, let, let me quickly move to, move to Renana and, and then to Guy, and then maybe you know, one or two comments if we, if we get a chance, but if we not, I hope you know, we'll still be able to capture uh, some of the more concrete steps uh, forward. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Aninde. 
And uh, also thank you to uh, all our speakers and participants and chairs. Um, <clears throat> there have been a lot of suggestions which have come out which we will be putting into a sort of way forward. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll come out with a short report on this which we can then take forward together. Uh, I'd like to say a few things that I think are important <clears throat> um, on the way forward. And to do that, first I'd like to sort of go back to why did we do this? Why are we interested in basic income? And the answer is that it is a new form, or not so new, but it is a form of social security to which this changing economy has to respond. So we have forms, different forms of social security. Um, here we only discussed government, uh, government subsidies and schemes, but there are other forms too, which we haven't discussed here. But the economy is changing, people are changing, governments are changing. What is a new, what is a form of social security that is, um, that fits this new changing, or uh, this changed economy, the most insecure economy. And that is where this idea of basic income comes in. So it's, a, uh, it's really to put something in place because the economy is becoming different from what it was 60 years ago. Um, given that uh, our, and I would say, I'm now saying from Siva's point of view, our view would be um, this must reach the, la the bottom 50% and then the last, the last, but definitely the bottom 50%. Does it benefit them? And that is what we need to keep uh, looking at or seeing in, and for our point of view, how does it benefit women? <clears throat> um, what are some of the way forward that did come out? I think something that's come very strongly is that we're a huge country. We have so many schemes, we have so many ideas, uh, but, and different things work in different places. So the very important part of having pilots. And pilots has to be within a government, possibly within state governments. But also uh, something that I'd like to say is the importance of people doing, or organizations actually doing pilots. And really the only two or three pilots that I know about are either done by SEVA or by JPAL. Um, I don't really know that, because when government does a pilot, you don't know whether it's studied, whether it's looked at, and so on. So, uh, and when I say pilot, I mean a real change. Um, at the grassroots level, not studying secondary data. Um, that's very useful too, but I'm talking about actual pilots which are studied well. Um, and that those are not very cheap. So when you do it, you have to put money into it. So I think this thing, this came out very strongly, the need for different types of pilots in different situations. Um, and we are very proud to be the first to do, first Delhi and then Madhya Pradesh but that's only a beginning, so can there be more of those? Uh, secondly, the point that I was trying to make, Sita made, others have made, Shekhar made, which is that um, a change of system is very disruptive. You're, change, you're, you're shaking up vested interests, um, and they are going to react. Nobody's just going to sit quiet when they lose uh, a source of earning. And this is the disruption immediately affects the most vulnerable. So how do you do a change of uh, system while protecting the most vulnerable? So when you measure how is it affecting those most vulnerable, then I think that's a very important uh, issue that we really need to continually keep in mind. That is where non-governmental organizations like us do become important. Uh, the third point I would like to make, and again, I'm saying it, I'm making it from our point of view, Seva's point of view, that our whole discussions, most discussions on these things <clears throat> are usually top down in the sense that they start at the center, thinking at the center. Um, that's where the money is and that's where the power is. 
But finally, you do have to build up opinion among <coughs> the people, uh, among elected representatives, um, among those who are actually, um, actually administering. And to do that, we go back to these pilots, which can be very small, because people on the ground, and this I'm saying from our experience in the villages or in cities, want to see before they can commit. So unless they see that, oh yes, this does change our life to the better, or you can bring people in to see that, okay, this group really did better by going to cash. You have to do, if you want to build up people's opinions, then you have to do things on the ground, A, and B, you have to spend enough time and energy to spread this out, which is why we asked Seva Madhya Pradesh to present that small campaign that they're undertaking. So I think this widespread information, not only at this level and in journals, but actually on the ground is a very important area. And finally, the financial system. Um, uh, we have worked with the financial system. I, I think Sanchita Ben presented Uttarakhand. We have worked in many, uh, many different places. We have our own bank. And actually, um, uh, this is a very thorny problem. You cannot say it will just happen. It won't just happen. Uh, and we feel that the uh, agent system, as Pavan said, the agent system is possible given the right incentives. Incentives will definitely come down. Uh, but it's not just incentives. It's incentives, it's technology, it's support, and it's literacy. So the whole assisted reaching the last mile is extremely important. And the second point is the unassisted, the cashless, the digital. That, you know, we talk about it and it hasn't really happened. So how to make that happen even at the last mile? You need a huge amount of digital literacy. I'm talking especially about women. Um, so I think a lot more experimentation, investment needs to go into both the BC model as well as into the cashless model. And these are areas of intervention that I especially wanted to highlight. Thank you. Thank you, Renan. Okay, sure. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be giving the final wrap up, as it were, especially as I'm one of the few non-Indians here. And I just was thinking how I should introduce these remarks. And I came up with a poem that I learned many years ago from a woman who was a labor economist, actually. Barbara Wooten was her name. And the poem is, it is from the dreamers of the impossible rather than the slaves of the possible that evolution draws its creative force. And I think uh, that affects my whole thinking about this subject. I first came to India and did a survey 40 years ago. So it makes me minus 10 when I was doing it, or something like that, if, in my mind. And I've learned so much over the years, and it was a great, great privilege, as far as I was concerned, when I was able to work with Sewa. I've been working with Sewa now nearly 20 years, and we were able to design and implement our pilot basic income schemes in West Delhi and Madhya Pradesh been a great privilege and we've come a long way since 2008 and the debate has matured in several key respects and I want to come back to that in a few minutes. I think yesterday was an impressive day. I said to Sarath and Renana at the end, oh it was impressive, there were good speeches, good speeches. Today it's been an exhilarating day because we've moved through the gears and we've seen the sort of questions that are coming up are being thrown up by the data, by the debates. And I think we should all be feeling 
rather possible, rather positive rather, and realizing that what we're talking about is part of the possible now. That is a huge, huge leap. And I heard during the night, I got a whole series of emails during the night that the government of Quebec has just announced that it's going to introduce basic income. And the debate on basic income is accelerating. And some of the pessimism I've heard about, you know, future generations down the road in many years to come, blah, 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 I think you could be proven uh, unnecessarily pessimistic because the rate of change of thinking is, is also accelerating, and it has to accelerate because we're in deep crises of many kinds, political, economic, social. So it's attendant on us actually to be possibly more optimistic than we might be when we had a beer or two. I think we have to, to take that position. I think since 2008, when I was first arguing for basic income in India, we've moved away from a horrible dialogue where several people wanted to sabotage, even pilots, even positive thinking about it, to a point where we're having a very interesting debate this conference has been dominated by the issue of targeting versus universalism and the fiscal space. But we've also only touched on one subject, which I know my friend Rahul Basu will go back to Goa wishing we had done more, which is about the alternative way of looking at a basic income as a way of sharing wealth and a, w a way of changing the nature of the state and thinking about reviving and res rescuing the commons which are being destroyed. That whole debate, which is actually a big one internationally now and should become much bigger, I predict that if we're going to have a conference in two years' time from now, that subject will be far more central than it has been in our conference today and yesterday. I would say to my friend Jan Bremen that we can't be cynical. I fully understand his concerns about the nature of the political economy and the state. Of course, we're faced with corruption and knowledge of the bureaucratic Raj, as Sika said, and we know about these things. But we, we can't allow that to cause a paralysis in the way we think about it. And I'm sure you agree on that point. But I also think that his, his adding to our discussion about the political realities has actually been a useful contribution, and I'd like to, to thank him for that. Now, the last mile issues that we had in the last session was actually addressed in our conference three years ago in the sense of the need for intermediation. Now, I do hope that those people who have been talking about that could go back and look at our book and study what we did and study the efforts of us to take that into account. Then we always talked about financial inclusion in 2010, 2011. How do you improve the last mile that is being talked about? And the experience that we gained, after all covering you know, thousands of people, I think is very important. And the role that a voice organization can play in that is something that we haven't really talked about. And it's partly our fault, because we haven't talked enough about that aspect of our study. I think it's the first time that a study of basic income has been conducted where we've tried to compare the effect of voice or places with, uh, uh, with other places that didn't have voice. You know, that's a design feature that we haven't emphasized enough, but it hasn't been introduced in cash transfer schemes in general. Very rare. And that leads me to the methodological point I want to emphasize, because I think this has come up uh, subtly in the last few years. 
we must respect diverse methodologies. We must respect that we can't evaluate any policy, any change with a single methodology. I happen to believe that randomization and randomized control trials are valuable, but I don't believe they should crowd out other forms of research. I had a debate with Angus Deaton recently about that, and he said, I thought you were a total randomista. I said, no. I think we learn a hell of a lot more from combination of methodologies and from anthropological research. And in our book, I found we ended up by emphasizing so much knowledge that we gained from our case studies, so much knowledge that we gained from our institutional research. And it's very, very important if there are going to be more pilots, and I hope there will be more pilots, because I agreed with the several points that successes in pilots will help erode inertia in political terms as well. And it's all in favor of that. But allow for the diversity of methodologies and respect for different methodologies. I plead with all of us to respect the need for pluralism in this regard. And nothing can replace feel People who have feel for development. There's one thing I've learned since 1977, 40 years of fieldwork experience, is that you learn feel. And there's no replacement for that. No degree of sophisticated statistical analysis can replace feel. And that feel will feed into the design of surveys, design of questionnaires, going out and collecting the information, and interpreting a story. Because ultimately, policy change and basic income is about enabling people to learn and tell a story. And that was why it was so valuable to have some of these people from Godekurd and elsewhere participating in our conference. Now, I'm in a strange position. I've been advocating basic income for 30 years. Ah, uh, bien, please join, bien a basic income earth network. And I found that in the last three years, among my colleagues, there has been skepticism about pilots, the value of pilots. Many of them say, we don't need pilots. We establish the need through philosophical, the reasons I was giving at the beginning of our conference, why have pilots? But the obvious reason is I would say, come to India, and you will see why you need pilots. Because pilots help to alter the debate and alter the capacity of people to understand. You or I, as an individual, may not think we need pilots, but we do need pilots because that will help in the political legitimation. And in that regard, I want to make one caution, one note of caution, about choice experiments and about certain type of randomized experiments. Because choice experiments, if you give a person a choice and you give the say, everybody in this room a choice of whether you go for a basic income or, or food, you take away the network and community effects. Because 30% may choose one, 30% choose another, 30% choose another. But that means that you don't have a community-wide effect in economic terms, in social terms, in philosophical terms, and so on. I think choice should be treated as one type of experiment, but we need community-level experiments most importantly. We've found the network effects, like that cooperative outcome, are fundamentally important, and if you neglect that, and then you do the low-hanging fruit hypotheses, you won't get to the fundamentals. Now, the last point I want to mention is that it's going to take intellectual courage 
not only by the researchers, not only by the politicians, but also by the funders. And I plead with those who are linked to funding agencies that even in these politically difficult times, to find ways of encouraging social policy experimentation that are geared to social inclusion, social solidarity, and a new income distribution system. It's a long battle, but we should all be part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. I think this is a very, very nice closure point. I don't think we need many more comments after this. And so may I request Sarath to take over and so that we may go to lunch and have some more informal networking. Thank you. Well, I think uh, we are, including me, we are eager to go for lunch. But um, I'm really exhilarated and very, very happy because as uh, INB, this is our first big uh, activity and I'm really, really happy. And uh, obviously something like this, uh, we need so many agencies coming together. And uh, to start with, I would like to thank IDRC, who were more like colleagues and academic friends. And we've been discussing this for the past um, one year. And uh, fortunately, I think this is the time many things came together, like chapter nine also came at the same time, and uh, giving a boost to the overall uh, gravitas of the topic itself. So uh, thank IDRC, and our study was made possible by uh, APPI, and we don't have any of the APPI is the Azim Premji Philanthropic Initiative, uh, partly, and Omidyar Network, partly. We have Sub Subhashish from Omidyar Network, but we don't have anybody from APPI because they have a retreat at this time. The entire staff have gone away to a retreat. Um, Thanks to them, uh, we have this uh, follow-up study. And uh, of course, the INBI team and the Seva Bharat team, um, last, I think, uh, three, four months, I think we've been really at it. I think before I go to that, I think this two days of uh, very rich discussion was made possible by the speakers. And we had really some of the best brains which are working on this topic were here. And I'm really, really happy that they were here, each of the speakers I would like to thank. And um, INBI team, of course, Renana and uh, Guy and uh, uh, Sita, um, I think we have had many, many sleepless nights to make this possible, thanks. And uh, Guy and other International Advisory Council members, they have been extremely supportive of this activity, and uh, Guy, of course, was always available. I think uh, most of the time he was answering his mails from airports. At least uh, <laughs> I have evidence of 16 airports. He's been, every time he was there, whenever we had a question, whether it is methodological or uh, a very mundane question. So um, thank you for the, to the participants. And uh, you, you all made this uh, rich uh, discussion. And I think, thank you so much. Thank you, all of you.